Afternoon, everybody. So, um, yeah, as, as um, Gerald said, uh, Vice President of Operations for West Coast Berry Farms and uh, General Manager of our Processing Division, which is called Agrifrost. Um, let's see this thing. This right here is, is a, a picture of one of our ranches in uh, it's Santa Maria, really actually Guadalupe, California, right up against the, the ocean there. And that's going to be the focus of our um, ranch, our, our theoretical ranch we're going we're gonna to run through um, for further discussion today. So uh, calling this topic California Dreaming. Strawberries, uh, if you're in ag in California, strawberries uh, is one of the crops that's sexier. People like it. Um, it. Tends to be funner than broccoli or potatoes or wheat or something like that. Um, but it's not for the faint of heart. Um, so uh, if you're going to get into farming strawberries or if you are with a company that is already farming strawberries and you're going to um, add another ranch, you gotta ask yourself some questions. Um, does what you wanna do fit in with what's going on in the world around you? Um, you know, look at the marketplace. You gotta look at um, you know, what are the costs to do this endeavor. You need to have an understanding of, of you know, the farming cost a break-even point of what it costs to produce a tray of strawberries. And um, you need to understand, can I finance the crop? Even if I want to do this, do I have the money to do it? California um, are, are strawberries, grow an acre of strawberries, it's incredibly expensive relative to a lot of other crops out there. So it takes a lot of capital, and so then do you have access to that capital? Um, so we'll look at these things and we'll then, well, you know, as we're looking at, at all of these financial aspects of what it takes to do a crop, we'll uh, then kind of go through the life cycle of putting a ranch in, whether it's your first ranch or it's your 1500th ranch or whatever it is, um, and uh, take you through the whole process, okay? All right, uh, a little about uh, my company. Um, so uh, the Jones family, uh, third generation farming family out of Oxnard, they own um, a fair amount of ground down there and they uh, acquired uh, at the assets of a company I worked for previously about in 2017, the company I worked for previous to that, the owners had passed away and the widows didn't want to be in the strawberry business anymore. and so. Uh, they, they made a, a, a pitch to acquire equipment, take on leases, and um, take the business forward. So that happened in September of 2017. Um, and at that point in time, it, the, the, the company was just West Coast Berry Farms. And since then, we built out different, what we call the, the different legs to a stool. Uh, and, and it's all in an effort to hedge against the farming risk. Far, you know, uh, farm, uh, uh, farming strawberries, you can be up in price, you can be down in price, and if you've got a good organization, you might be a little better than other guys, you might, you know, if you're not good, you might be a little worse, but you're, you're all rising and falling on the same tide a lot of the time. So you have to come up with other aspects of the business to, that will allow you in the bad times to continue forward. So, we have a, we now have a sales company, which is called Babalu Berry Farms, and they manage all the sales for our ranches, and they also manage sales for outside growers in California and in central Mexico. Um, we, we own a cooler in Oxnard that cools our berries and several other growers' berries. And so the income streams that are earned from, from those two organizations um, just add stability to, to the farming function. And uh, then the last company is Agrifrost, which I'm, I'm the general manager of. And there we process uh, the strawberries from our ranches and other ranches um, uh, when, they're, when they move out of the fresh market. What, what yes. Does Agrifrost, 
Agrifrost, our, our, our processing facility is located down in Oxnard, California, and it's, that, that's where our headquarters is too. And we'll, we'll, we'll just, here, we'll just jump through, uh, we're gonna jump through all these here. So a West Coast Berry Farm. So um, the farming operation, um, we farm uh, 525 fall planted acres in Oxnard, and this year we're, we're farming 115 acres of summer planted strawberries. In Santa Maria, we have 415 acres of fall planted strawberries and we'll be at 265 acres of summer planted strawberries there. Our total crop and ground this year, 1,320 acres. Uh, and our projected uh, 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 trays that we, we expect to produce is 7.3 million trays. And the value of, uh, of a tray of strawberries on average varies from region to region. In Oxnard, you know, we budget uh, uh, 1250 a tray in terms of value. We hope to exceed that. In, in Santa Maria, we're budgeting more like 1150. Uh, if we were up in Salinas, it'd probably be more like 1050, 1075, just it, it, because of where, where, where the market windows are and where the volume is at, during the, the times of years that they're in production. Yes. Uh, the 1,320 acres for this year, is that more than you did last year? We've been growing. Yeah, yeah. So we, well, I'll take you through the whole thing. But we, yeah, we, we're, 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 up, we're up this year from last year. We've had two really good years in a row. And we, we just like all growers, we, we do dumb things. When you make a lot of money, then you put more acres in because you think you're going to make more money. And that's usually not what happens. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're, we're up about 300 acres from last year and are, are, we're projected to go up another 300 acres between fall and summer planted next season based on what we have in terms of leases that are, that are, that are in the works and plant orders and so on. We'll go through, go through those deals. So we're, we're kind of on this, this growth path here and we hope we don't hit the wall. We'll see. Our uh, sales company, Bob Lou Berry, Far Berry Farms. Uh, we have four salesmen and three sales support people. They're, they're uh, led by our vice president of uh, sales, Anthony Galino. Um, he's been with us for three years now, and he, he came to us from California Giant, which uh, uh, one of the larger um, uh, shippers out there. He'd been with them since he was out of college, he's, he's, uh, he's, he was with them for uh, 30 plus years, and, and then came over, came over to us, um, like I said, three years ago, and he's doing a great job for us. Um, Cindy Jewell heads up our marketing, our marketing effort, and she also is formerly from Cal Giant. Um, so we rep the, the, the sales organization represents uh, ourselves and uh, three other growers in California, and then, and then several growers out of uh, uh, Michoacan, Zamora, Mexico, and, and Maravitillo, Mexico. And, and what we're trying to do is keep our, our customers, the supermarket chains, in supply with, with fresh strawberries 52 weeks a year. And you've got a lot of seasonality in California. Mex Central Mexico hits the, the winter window. Uh, Oxnard hits late winter into the, into, into the spring. Santa Maria Salinas, Santa Maria hits spring, summer, fall, and, and uh, Salinas Wattsville hits later spring, summer, into the winter. You just kind of wrap your way around, around the calendar. Um, the organization earns sales commission from our farming operation and the other growers, and that's a hedge against the farming risk that we, we do with the 1,300 acres of, uh, of uh, strawberries that we're growing. This is actually year in and year out the most profitable part of our business is the shipping side of the business consistently. Uh, the family owned, the Jones family owned Superior Cooling. Uh, it is uh, a cooler in, in Oxnard. They own, they own uh, about 90% of the cooler. There's one other grower that is, owns uh, uh, the other 10%. And we send our strawberries through there. We, we own a lot of ground in the region and we also rent some of that ground out to other growers and if they want this really good strawberry ground 
then they need to send their berries through our cooler. So we, the goal is, is to max out units through the cooler uh, and, and it's a consistent, you know, consistently profitable business. Good market, bad market, doesn't matter. If you're pushing units through the cooler, you've got a, you know, you've got a certain amount you've got to push through, but if, if you get close to your budget, you're going you're gonna to do pretty well. Agrifrost, uh, the process, our processing division, um, about 55% of the volume out of the field comes off of our own ranches. And it's, we're, we're taking in um, uh, berries that we cull from the fresh market. That's the biggest part of our business. We're running what we call strawberry juice stock. And so that's strawberries that are in that bucket there with the calyx on. Um, they're simply a byproduct of the fresh market. When, when the pickers are picking the, the, the tray of strawberries, you don't always have a perfect fresh market strawberry on there. Sometimes you have a berry that's too small, slightly overripe, has a, a cat face or a split in it. Um, there's something not quite right about it. That berry, we pay the picker to not put it in the pack, put it into a little bucket there that, 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 that's hanging off the, uh, the end of their picking cart and then that works its way to a trailer that, that where the, the juice bucket is dumped into a tray that eventually works its way, a plastic crate that works its way into our processing plant. And we'll use those berries there to make strawberry puree, uh, where we, we wash, the, wash the berries, um, sort them, and then put them through uh, finishing screens and press them and screen out the seeds and the calyx and stuff like that. And you just have puree that you sell to jam manufacturers, to um, beverage companies, and that sort of deal. Um, then the other part of the business is the freezer pack business, uh, which is the grade A processing berries. Those strawberries uh, come to us once a season is over for the fresh market for, for a district. So in Oxnard, we'll grow fresh straw strawberries for the fresh market December, till about Mother's Day. And by that time, our, our berries down in Oxnard are getting a little weaker, smaller, can't ship as well versus the, the berries that are in Santa Maria or Salinas Watsonville. And so the fresh market buyers, the supermarket chains, we don't want Oxnard anymore. So they say, bye-bye. Well, we've still got a big crop out there and that goes to the processors. So it's either to our plant or to other plants. And um, that fruit, gets the, the calyx gets removed in the field it comes into us into the plant and then we run it up our inspection wa in, uh, wash stations and inspection lines and we're packing them into pails drums six six and a half cases or into what we call an iqf pack and uh freezing the product and sending it off to cold storage and there it, you you hold the product and sell it out to your customers throughout the year um, as they need orders to, 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 fill their con, you know, to fill their contracts and their demand. And uh, the, the processing business tends to be fairly stable also in terms, it doesn't make, it doesn't have the wild fluctuations that you'll see in, in, in profitability that you'll see on the farming side, but it, it tends to be very steady. So again, another hedge against the farming. Any questions? Uh, just uh, here's a, a picture of the, uh, our, our processing plant with inspection lines um, running strawberry there. Uh, here we're filling drums. This is right, we also run raspberry. So right, right in this picture here, we're filling 400 pound drums of raspberry and that'll end up in a, a, a beverage base and, 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 uh, and drink somewhere. In fact, that's an organic raspberry. It ends up in little, the little uh, fresh bottles of uh, fresh juice bottles is where that ends up. Okay, uh, back to farming strawberries. Califor in California, you've got three major growing regions and a small one. Orange County right now, there, that's where I grew up used to be about 2,000 acres of strawberries down there. Now it's about 200. They grow condos now. Um, 
Oxnard uh, is about 5,900 acres of strawberries, uh, of, of, of fall planted strawberries and 3,000 uh, some, what, summer. Uh, Santa Maria now has turned into the biggest district between summer and uh, fall planted crops. Salinas Watsonville is the second biggest. And actually we'll, we'll, we'll get into the acres here on the next slide. Um, this is how the acreages have ebbed and flowed over the last five years. And what I wanna do is, is uh, look at Santa Maria, since this is where we're gonna take our, our, our hypothetical ranch. And you can see how the acres have been gradually growing in this district over the last five years. Um, Oxnard's kind of stayed fairly stable. Um, Salinas Watsonville has been edging down. And there's the, what are the reasons for that? Rain. <laughs> What's that? I said rain. It's the rain where they can't go into the filter. Not, not rain, but water's critical. You can't do this without the right water. What's that? Uh, uh, that plays into it. The primary driver of whether a, a, a region goes up or down in acreage is if growers are making money. Okay. Um, it, it's a combination of that and having good strawberry ground available in the region. In Oxnard over the last five years, actually it's been a, that's been the one district that's been very, very profitable, but there's just, Getting beyond that five, 6,000 acres, there's not a lot of ground there that's real conducive to growing strawberries. Um, and so it's, we've been fortunate, it's just, it stayed stable and, and everybody seems to make money down there. Santa Maria, there's a lot more ground available. Uh, and, and so it keeps growing and at some point it, it might get painful for us. Um, Salinas Watsonville, it's the, it, it, on the fall plant side, it has been the biggest district. Uh, I can see it's still bigger in Santa Maria now, but, but with fall plant, with summer planted acres, that's that the, the total acres in Santa Maria is actually up. Um, but what you're seeing right now is 2018, we had a, 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 a really tough time. The industry is too many acres at that time relative to demand in the marketplace. And we all lost a ton of money. Uh, then acreage dropped as a result, edged down a little bit and 21, 2020, 2021, 2022, we made money. Uh, but the acreage is going up as a result and that we could pay for it here. Here's, here's the acreages in the, in the other growing regions. Florida, been pretty stable. Uh, Central Mexico, the numbers that come out of central Mexico are really unreliable. They don't have a good reporting system. So I don't, you get, use it kind of as a barometer. And I think something weird happened from last year to this year. It, they didn't go up that many acres, but uh, anyway, those are the numbers that, that, that their, their, their groups down there are telling us. They didn't cross a whole lot more uh, across the border this year versus last year. Okay, uh, summer planted acres. And so the, the uh, summer plant strawberry is a berry that, 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 that goes into cold storage when it's harvested from the nurseries. And then we bring it out later and plant it late spring, summer, trying to manipulate that berry to produce when it doesn't want to, which is in the late fall and winter when the markets are at their highest point because supply is tighter. Um, Oxnard's been fairly stable. Santa Maria uh, was going up, 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 up. And then now we're getting numbers from the Strawberry Commission saying there's a huge drop there. Uh, nobody believes it. We think, we think we're getting bad numbers there too. We think that that's probably still about 5,000. But uh, anyway, th those are the numbers that the commission's reporting, Strawberry Commission's reporting to us right now. We hope, we hope it's gone down. So they get, they actually, the commission gets really accurate numbers. Uh, they, they, they reach out to the shippers who tend to control the whole industry and they get, they have them report. But if they don't, if they aren't getting the reports from the, from a shipper or an individual grower, they actually go on to satellite imagery and, and map out the acres now. And so they get pretty accurate numbers. Now with the, with the summer planted acres, 
it's a, right now they're giving us a number. It's a projection because we haven't planted it yet. You so know. Eventually, it will be. Eventually, it'll be accurate. It won't be accurate for probably another three months. Three, we will we'll get accurate numbers by by August once it's all on the ground and going. Um, so they're projecting a 1,300 acre decrease, and part of it. Uh, this year is there were some there was some trouble at, in, at the nursery level and a couple nurseries um, One nursery just pulled the plug all together and, and stopped growing, you know after they'd taken orders and Another nursery w was have was uh, having having trouble and so th they're backing way off And so maybe it's right with a, a tighter supply of plants. We'll see if it is we're gonna have a great fall fall and winter winter market Um all right, so so we, we we took a look at acres there, and so if you when you're when you're analyzing, okay, do I want to do this? You, you're looking at where is acreage going, and and do I want to put more acres in, or should I reduce acres and not get slaughtered when there's too many? So you got to ask yourself. Next thing you need to ask yourself is is there a demand for my crop? If I can grow this crop, does somebody want to buy it? Um, from 2015 to 2019, consumption was growing just fairly stable. It's a slight increase. It's basically in line with population growth, 1% to 3%. 2020, all our lives get turned upside down, get hit with COVID, shuts the economy down. What does that do for strawberries? Okay, yes. True. Any any other thoughts? People were cooking more at home because they weren't going out and that drove up raw produce. Exactly. Yep, that's what happened. There are a lot of winners and losers in, in, in the in the COVID era and strawberries was a winner because eighty five percent of our marketplace is with the supermarket chains. And restaurants got shut down. Everybody got told to stay home. Everybody's eating from home. It changed buying habits and demand went through the roof. The berry category is uh, in, in uh, 2020, 2021 uh, uh, went up 12.7% from 7.3 to 8.3 billion pounds, more or less. Um, Strawberries make up 60% of, of, the, of the berry category. So demand's through the roof now. Acreage is up. Okay. Demand seems to be up more than acreage. Maybe we put some more acres in. We'll see. If you think demand's good, you, need, you, you, you should be able to sell your crop. And so... If you're a, a, an independent grower, you're gonna, uh, you're, you're gonna be looking for a shipper to sell your berries for you. You know, if, if you're, you're somebody who wants to start a 50 acre ranch or, or, or whatever and just get in this thing, you don't have enough, there's not time in a day for you to grow that crop and then for you to go out there and sell that thing in a commercial manner. It's just, the, the, the guys just, the, the, it's hard to do. Um, so you need, to, you need to find a, a shipper that you're going to work with that you believe is going to sell your crop at the right price um, to maximize your, you know, your, maximize your return. Or if you're somebody that's bigger, more established, then most likely you have developed your own sales team and, and they're, they're, they're selling it for you. Um, The keys to being able to move this crop uh, are, are one, have, have good, a good sales team. Two, you need to put up a quality pack. It's gotta, it's gotta be something that, that the supermarket chains can receive in, it's gonna make arrivals, and will, will, will last on the shelf better than your competition, or at least equal to your competition. If you're not doing a good job, you're not getting your, your crop harvest rotation done timely uh, and you're sending fruit in that's just a little overripe and the supermarket chains can't move the fruit through through distribution they're not going to want to buy from you so you got to make sure that you can put a pack up 
And if you're putting a good pack up, that's, that's, that's job number one to getting a repeat order. And, and then say in the case of Walmart, say you're, you're, you're a supplier to Walmart. If you keep giving them good quality and, and your rejection rate is 1% or less, then that one DC you have with them now might turn into two or three DCs next year. They are always constantly, whether it's Walmart, Kroger, Albertsons, whatever it is, they are always measuring your performance and rewarding guys that perform well for them and punishing guys that don't, don't perform well for them. A DC? a DC is a distribution center. So with Walmart, I think in produce, sales team would kill me for not knowing this. I think they have 52 DCs and the state of produce DCs in the United States and the, the US. And so that distribution center will, will supply Southern California, you know, as, an, as a, for instance, they might have one or two DCs in Southern California. They might only have one DC in Montana. You now, just depends on, on the area. Um, So anyway, um, so with your, your, your sales team, what, if you're providing them quality, then, then the customers like what you're doing. You're, you're, if you're, you've got a quality product, you can then start to work with the top retailers to develop what we call program business. Okay, that, and what that is, is you're negotiating with the large retailers out a month, two months at a time, or even in some cases, we have customers where we, we actually program the, the, the pricing for the whole year. And what, it, what we're, we're trying to achieve is, is, is a situation where they keep you off the floor when markets are low, but you don't drill them into the ground with high prices when markets are high, but it's at a level that you're gonna make money. And um, that's key to being able to stay sustainable and keep on going. Um, if you've got your own, whether you're with a shipper or if, if you've got your own sales team, you also want to have a good marketing program in place that's promoting your brand, your quality, that sort of deal out there, engaging in social media, um, all these things to create buzz about what it is you're, you're, you're doing out there and the product you're, you're, you're selling. Yes. Oh shoot, cautionary tale. Okay, we'll go, we'll go back, okay, cautionary tale. And this, this revolves around having a good sales team. So when West Coast Berry Farm started in 2017, um, they, they, they pre, in 2016, they were a contract grower for my previous company, which was Eclipse Berry Farms. And they were, they were contract farming 250 acres of strawberries in Oxnard for Eclipse Berry Farms, which was a much larger organization farming 1,200 of their own acres in Oxnard, Santa Maria, and Salinas, and they were the sales organization. Eclipse goes away, and uh, West Coast Berry Farms, the Jones family, saw it as an opportunity. Hey, we've always wanted to be our own shipper, and we always wanted to be a multi-district grower. We can just step into all these leases that, that take years to acquire and develop with the relationships with landlords and so on, we can just step right in. We're going to do this. So they, they, West Coast Berry Farms stepped up and went from 250 acres to 1,200 acres overnight. And we decided not to take the sales team from Eclipse. There were some personality issues. And so they went and brought a, a family friend in who was a broker to head the sales, sales effort for this new organization. The whole deal came on in the fall and you need to have your sales programs in place already. And so we were behind the curve trying to get our sales up and running. And here we go, we're gonna have a crop that's coming in the spring and summer that's gonna be a lot of fruit. So, you know, all hands on deck, we're, we're all trying, trying to help get this going. We run into some bad luck, the whole industry did in 2018. Um, we had, the industry had two freezes 
uh, one in February and one in March, and they're both deep, hard freezes. Um, and so what happens when you have a freeze is, is it, it first thing it does is it damages the, the, the fruit that's on, on, the, on the vines, okay? Um, it'll also damage the flowers. Um, so the short-term impact is as you lose fruit that's, that, that's there right now. Okay, so you take a hit, it might be a hit for two, three weeks where you're not picking as much, or if you've damaged the flowers, uh, that's your fruit 30 days from now. So, you know, it's going to reduce production then. The, the other thing that a freeze does is it invigorates the plants. It supercharges them. And so we had two of these back to back about a month apart. And what it did was it actually created a great market for Oxnard. It just cleared the decks all the way up and down the state where there was no fruit. Oxnard actually had the, the least amount of the freeze. So we, we were going and, and we were supplying and we were doing great in Oxnard. But what it did was it, it, it made it so that when Santa Maria and Salinas Watsonville hit with their crops that got pushed back, You'd stripped off all the load that was on the plants, and now you got all this vigor that's in the plants. They just hit hard. It was like a tsunami of fruit. And from the week after Mother's Day to Labor Day, the fresh market was trading seven, eight dollars for week after week after week. When we go through production costs, you'll see your production cost is 10, 11 dollars a tray. And so, and you have to keep picking them. You can't just stop. You can't say, oh, you know, when you're a third of the way into your crop, you have to keep picking it. If you don't, you're gonna lose the whole ranch. So every week you're picking strawberries, sitting in the fresh market, and you're paying to do it. You're not, getting, you're not getting a return back. You're losing money every week that it's going out. And it was like that for four straight months. It, our sales team, you know, that we had in place then um, wasn't ready for it. It probably wasn't fair for us to put this on all of them, but they didn't have the programs in place. They didn't have the relationships in place. And we probably took it harder than some of these other shippers out there. The industry average this year in 2018 for the losses was 10,000 an acre. We lost more. There were some guys that lost as much as 20,000 an acre. You start extrapolating that over 30,000 acres in the state, it's painful. Um, so that's where we're at. It was like year one, welcome to the industry. Got pounded into the ground. So, um, but we hung on. We lost so much money that the bank, who's your partner, is really your partner now. <laughs> like. We can't walk away, <laughs> we're stuck with you. And so fortunately our bank you know, believed in us because they, they, they had a relationship, they knew we could grow a crop and so on. So they, they were hopeful, they weren't gonna have to write this thing off. And they, they, they supported us the next year and the next year after that and fortunately it's panned out. But that's the cautionary tale is, if you're going into this, you better have a good sales plan. If you can't make money, you won't be doing this for very long. So let's go into the grow costs for uh, a ranch. Um, down, this, down this side there, the different, different kind of aspects of, of uh, farming and the per acre cost that is projected for us for 2022 on a ranch in Santa Maria. Last year, our total grow cost was about a hair over 32,000 an acre. We're projected to be closer to 34,000 an acre this year because everything is more expensive. Plastics more, your plastic mulch is more expensive. Your drip tape's more expensive. Your fertilizers, your fertilizers through the roof. Now, if you're seeing all the news on, on where fertilizer prices are going, oh, it's real, They're, it's through the roof. Um, fuel, labor costs keep going up. So all these things are adding up and up and up. This is what it costs us to grow in, Santa, in the Santa Maria district to grow a crop, 33, 33 nearly $34,000 an acre. So let's do some break-even analysis on this. 
Their grow cost is 33,930. Um, that's that's, that's kind of your, 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 your base there. Then the other, the other aspect of, of, of farming is your harvesting of the product. So our, our labor, we're projecting our labor to pick the crop is going to be three, 375 per tray this year. Our package, our, we, 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 got, we, we call these variable costs here, pick, pack, and cool. The pack is packaging. Um, our packaging cost uh is approaching two dollars a tray now that's your the cost of your clamshells and the fiber tray that you put it in um, and then the cost to, to make the fiber tray is shape it and form it and then the cooling cost is 55 cents per tray in our case in oxnard about half of that is going to go back into our pocket and margin and cooling in our in our in our cooler in in, in oxnard in santa maria we're at an outside cooler and they're making the money. So you've got a harvest cost of 630 per tray. We budget very conservatively on yield in Santa Maria. This is budgeted for a 12 month cycle. There are two different cycles of, of, of grow and harvest that you can do in Santa Maria. Um, one is a 12 month cycle where you plant and grow and harvest and then replant on the same acres in the same 12 month period you'll start over again you won't rotate but you have to stop your harvest sooner you'll stop harvesting first week of september maybe the second week of september the other way you can go if you're out on the coast like we are is you could chase it into october and november on the harvest side and you turn it into a 15 or 16 month cycle that's how we used to do all of our Santa Maria and Salinas stuff was, was a 16 month cycle. And what we've found is that it really doesn't pencil. What we found is that once you get to September, towards the end of September, your yields are going down to the point where your harvest cost is skyrocketing. And you end up, even you may have a higher market price at that point in time, you end up um, you end up uh, uh, just trading dollars, not really making money. So what we've done is we decided to just condense it down to the 12 month cycle where your, your, your harvest efficiencies are at their best. And then we come in with our summer planted acres that start coming on in September and have a good crop out of the gate and you keep your harvest efficiency way up there into the fall. So we're, we're planning, two crops to do the job where before we tried to do with one crop and couldn't make money. And what we found is with the two crops, we do make money. So back to budgeted trays. So when it was a 16 month cycle, we'd budget 10,000 trays per acre. With, this, with the 12 month cycle, we're budgeting 7,500 trays per acre. Um, so your harvest cost at 7,500 trays per acre 630 a tray to do it is $47,250 per acre. You add that to your growing cost and then divide it by the number, your budgeted trays you think you're gonna pick, that gives you your break even point for growing and harvesting a tray of strawberries. Let's see if I can go back. So, so here we go, so we got 1082 harvest. It's not working. Let's see. How do we go backwards? What's that? What if we took it out of this? I guess you have to have it in this, don't you? Let's see here. How do you do that? Try, try oh, there we go. Here we go. There we go. All right. So let's go back to this slide here. This this graph uh, got shown to me by uh, Rick Tomlinson, who's the who's the uh, president of the California Strawberry Commission, in 2019. 
they did this analysis after the slaughter of 2018, and this picture says it all. It gives you, an, it gives you the production curve in California against the price, the F, average FOB price against that production curve. So what does that tell you you want to do? If you're going to put in a, an acre of strawberries or a 50 acres of strawberries or 100 acres of strawberries, where do you want it to produce? Where it's at the highest point itself. Out on the shoulders as much as possible. Your most profitable area opportunity is October, November, December, January through the end of March, into April a little bit. That's where the money is to be made. In the middle, you've got strawberries that are peaking like this. You've got grapes. You've got peaches, plums, cherries. We don't operate in a vacuum. There's other things out there competing for that uh, percentage of the stomach. It says, it says other crops. And so pricing gets beat into the ground in the summer months because we're producing at heavy, at heavy volume and all of our competition in terms of other, other, other crops is doing the same thing. COVID changed this some. That curve now is the last two years, our, our average through the summer months was over $10. So that makes it a little more palatable. But ideally, if, you're, if you are a statewide grower, you want to emphasize producing around the summer months as much as possible. The trick though, is if you want to have all the good retailers in your camp, you have to supply them year round. So you don't get a duck out completely in the slaughter in the summer months. But what, we try, what we're trying to do is minimize the exposure as much as we can and then emphasize out on, out on the shoulders, as we say. Okay, so if you think you've got a good sales team that can get you more than that 1082 for your ranch in Santa Maria, um, and you know you can grow a good crop and, and support them, you need to know if you can finance the crop. So I gave you a, a cost of 39,000, or, uh, 39, uh, or I'm sorry, $33,930 to grow the crop. To get it to harvest, 22, 25,000, I'm just gonna say 25,000 to make it easy. And then once you get into harvest, then you start to turn the cash over and you kind of start financing yourself. But you're gonna need to come up with the capital to get that 100 acres in the ground. It's gonna be roughly $2.5 million to do that. So there, if you've got 2.5 million that's burning a hole in your pocket, you could finance it all yourself. If you've got a good relationship with a bank, they'll typically loan 75% of the value of the crop and ground. So for, in our case, we need to come up with working capital, the money out of our own pocket of 625,000 and we rely on the bank to supply the other 1.875 million. And then we're gonna obviously pay them interest to, to, to borrow that money and then we better pay it back or they'll come take the ranch if you own the ranch. Questions? Well, oh, I gotta go fast. Okay, so should you do that? Okay, if, if you can answer yes to all those questions and you wanna grow a crop, with all that in mind, you can supply the quality, you can supply the, uh, the, 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 you got the good sales plan, you can finance it, then you gotta move, like I gotta move right now. <laughs> to, 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 to get a, a, a crop in the ground, it's a long process. So we have a ranch that is right, it's a, from that ranch that was pictured, it's about a half a mile away just down the road along the coast that we're, we, I've been working on for the better part of four years trying to get the landlord to give us the lease. Take it from somebody else, give it to us. 
a lot of lunches, a lot of drinks. <laughs> Finally, just this last, last uh, it was about, uh, shoot, it was, uh, uh, it was about three months ago he gave us confirmation he's going to give us the lease. That lease starts January 1 of 2023. 20, uh, so we, if, you're, you pick up a, if you pick up a lease, what you need to have done before then is understand, is this ranch where I want it? Does it have the right mi microclimate? Does it have the right water? Quality of water is everything in strawberries. You need something with a pH of about 6.5 to 6.7 ideally. Same with the soil. You want the right pH in the soil. You can adjust with uh, an acid system in your water if the pH is, is out of balance. You can, you can kind of monkey with it there, but that's what you want ideally. Then you need to, uh, so we secure the lease, you need to order plants. And, and there's, a time, there's a cycle for plants um, that uh, 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 you have to have your order in basically about now. Right about now is the cutoff. So we got our plant order in now. If you get that lease three months from now, you might be able to get plants, might not. Then you're going to have ground that's going to, you're going to have to sublet to someone else until you can get it going. All right, so you get your plants ordered. Uh, you got to, uh, th then when you get the ranch, you've got to uh, get the ranch ready to plant. So you're going to, ideally, if you've got plenty of time, which we do in this case, you're going to put a cover crop on it in the spring. You're going to disc that in. Then uh, in summertime, you're going to get in and rip the ranch, deep rip the ranch. We do, we do it, uh, a deep, deep rip in two different directions uh, at 45 degree angles. Um, then we'll plow it. If you need to break, if, if there's material in there, that, that, you know, plant material you need, you need to, to plow in, you do that. We don't always plow. A lot of guys really like to. Um, then you're going to disc the ranch two to five times depending on the soil type. If you've got really light sandy loam soil, two times you're gonna be good. If you've got stuff that's heavy ground, it's clay up in Salinas and Castroville, they got some heavy ground, it's torture. You might be you know, five, six, seven times disking, it's, it's brutal. Cal Poly, yes, right out here, that's as, about as heavy as you get. Um, so yeah, yeah, disking is, is variable depending on your ground. Then you'll land plane it, Three, three, different, three, three different directions, 45 to the bed uh, on two passes, and then along the bed for your third pass. Uh, then we'll f when we pick up a ranch, we always want to flat fume it versus fumigate it in the beds through the drip tape because you, bet, you get a better, a better kill and a more, uh, well, it spreads it out better when you flat fume. So we, we flat fume uh, initially. Um, You'll chisel it and then we'll pre-irrigate, which is soak the ground. We'll pre-irrigate for 12 hours. And what you're trying to do is, is, is get the ground wet so that, when you can, so that you can go and then shape the beds. And this, so you soak the ground, then you gotta let the ground start to dry out and it will depend, anywhere for, it takes anywhere from a week to two weeks, depending on the soil, before it's just right to go in and start um, shaping your beds. You do that list, then you're going to install your pre-plant fertilizer if you use pre-plant fertilizer. We used to. We've now gone away from that. We're 100% we're, we're drip, drip applied fertilizer now, liquid. Um, and we just spoon feed it as it's needed. A lot of guys swear by pre-plant. They might put 500, 600. There are guys that put 1,000 pounds per acre in. We just ran into too many troubles where it would burn the plants, uh, burn the rootstock. Um, then you, you wrap plastic mulch, or you insert the drip tape, wrap plastic mulch, uh, and then you got your beds ready, then you cut, cut the roads and the drainage ditches, and you in install your irrigation system, and then mid-October you're going to plant your strawberries, and that's done by hand, um, with rootstock that comes down from the nurseries. Then you start growing, and then you get to, uh, harvest in the spring. And I'm just going to skip ahead. You guys can look at this uh, later if you'd like, all the different steps that you're going to go through. So the new ranch is just down the road from here. Here's, uh, here's uh, some pictures of uh, nurseries. 
uh, the one on the left, Cedar Point Nursery, the one on the right, Lassen Canyon. So that's your nursery stock that's going to get mowed and then dug like you dig potatoes. And they dig up all the rootstock, bring it into trim sheds, and they trim it up. And it looks like that's what the strawberry plants look like when they come to us when we plant them in the ground. Right now, they're a little green there. They're not ready for planting, but that was about a month before harvest. That's Wonder Dog. I was in that field up at the nursery. This is Cedar Point, at Cedar Point Nursery, and it just makes me laugh. Uh, Mike Fawner, the owner of Cedar Point Nursery, and I were in there looking at the plants a month before harvest. They were going to start digging them for us. It's super windy, and we, j we, just, we were done doing what we were doing. We turned around, and there's this damn dog standing up on, the t on his throne there on this truck. It wasn't Mike's dog, it was the neighbor's dog. He had just run up, jumped up on top of the truck there. Just makes me laugh. Anyway, this is uh, Mike Fawner, uh, owner of Cedar Point Nurseries. He passed away this, year, this last year from COVID, unfortunately. So this is, my, this is my tribute to him, Wonder Dog. Uh, cover crop, this is off of our, our ranches in Salinas when we used to farm in Salinas. After 2018, we got our heads bashed in. We pulled out of Salinas. We couldn't do it anymore. All right. Uh, let's see. So this. Here's, here's, here's a, a, a video of bedding up right there. If you're going to be inserting pre-plant fertilizer, it'd be with that unit right there. We're, at that point in time, we're simply uh, using it to com compress the beds a little more. And here's a, here's a, a, a belted tractor pulling our listing bar bed shaper uh, to shape the beds. That's a sandy loam soil. Cuts like butter. That's what strawberries like best is sandy loam. They don't perform as well on heavy ground. You gotta, you gotta work harder. Everything's harder on heavy ground. You can do it. It's just everything's harder. Michael? Yes. The, the reason we pulled out of Salinas was, was we had to in 2008. We, we, we lost so much money in 2018, we had to contract. And that's what happens in the, in, in, in the farming cycle. Growers make a lot of money, they add acres, and then markets turn on them. You, you, you subtract acres. We lost the most money in Salinas. Their crop comes in the summer, heavy in the summer, and it, you know, prices there are inherently lower. So we're like... We can cover all of our needs out of Santa Maria and Oxnard with the, the summer plant and fall plant cycle. We don't need to be in Salinas and we're never going back. Other guys love it up there. Uh, here, we're, here we're inserting drip tape into the uh, beds after they've been shaped. Then what'll happen is they'll, they'll, in, they'll, they'll install the manifold at, at, at the end of the drip tape, you know, when we start, once we get the, the uh, plastic mulch on, which is gonna happen here. And uh, speaking of plastic mulch, there are all sorts of different colors, black, green, brown, panda, clear, uh, white, and they all do different things. They give you different temperatures in the bed Sometimes you want to warm the bed up to get out fast. Sometimes you want to keep things cool. Like for a summer planting, you want white plastic that's going to keep things cold. You're trying to hold the plant back in the summer when you plant it so it doesn't go vegetative. Um, black plastic gives you better weed control. Clear plastic or panda plastic. Panda plastic is black on the sides and clear on top. That will get you out faster. So if you're an oxtard, you're trying to get out fast into the marketplace, you might go with something like that but you're going to have much more you're going to spend a lot more money in weed control and you're also going to suffer on fruit quality later in the season because the bed's too warm the berries end up being smaller berries and 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 softer and all that stuff in oxnard where we stay 100 percent black we just act like we're not in a hurry to get out even though you want to it gives us better quality through the whole season through the whole oxnard season in santa maria we're a combination of um uh, green and brown, which is a kind of a compromise on those things. Anyway, 
That's what your strawberry rootstock looks like when it comes from the nursery when you're about to plant. Here we are planting uh, some summer plant acres. Um, so they're pulling them out of those boxes and, and just kind of putting them in bags and moving them along. And you got to press them in. You, you run a, a hole punch over, the, over that bed. I didn't have a video of a hole punch. I couldn't believe it, but I don't. Um, anyway, the holes get punched and then you just manually push, push the rootstock in there and squeeze the dirt around it and then start irrigating. That's about probably a month into, month into uh, uh, the, the planting cycle there, plants moving along. Wet winters. This is an, the picture of one of our ranches in Oxnard. Uh, we want the water. We really want, we need California, we need as much water as we get, so we want it to rain. But boy, does it make a mess of the fields. And it, you know, obviously you have crop damage when it rains, depending on how much. Um, uh, but on par, we, we, we would ra rather have the rain than not have the rain as long as it's not in April. Uh, frost protecting. Your, your, your danger is February, March tends to be your real danger because you got a crop and, and that's when you tend to run into freezing weather. Some ways we deal with it are rain birds, micro sprinklers, wind machines. And in Oxnard, we use helicopters. We'll contract with a, a company in um, Santa Paula to come out and when we're, when we're, you know, that, that helicopter had probably been out since three in the morning and he's, we're paying him to fly up and down the field and just keep the air moving. Uh, in an effort to protect against a freeze and it's effective. Cost about 2,500 bucks an hour per helicopter. Oops. Equinox. It's that point when the days go from short to long or getting longer. And that is when strawberries take off, whether it's in Oxnard or Santa Maria. They're off to the races and, and uh, here we go. Some things we have to deal with on uh, pests. Our two major uh, 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 pet pests that we fight are the two spotted spider mite. We got sprays, pesticides we can use for them, but you don't, you, they're not unlimited and you gotta rotate them. Dusting your roads, keeping the roads wet. The, the, the two spotted spider mite really likes dust. And so you really wanna minimize as much as possible. So that's why you always see us running water. Um, Ligus bugs is the other one. We try and kill those with not only with pesticides, but with these, what are called bug vacuums there. We just suck them up and splat them against those, those, uh, those shields there, basically. Imagine, imagine you know, a bug splatting on, on the window of your car. That's basically the principle there. Just suck them up and kill them. Those things eat the fruit. The spider mites eat the plant, take the plant down. Harvest. This was taken a couple days ago in our ranches in Oxnard. Here's an example of a harvester doing what we call a dual pack. So he's picking for fresh market and picking for the, for the juice there for the processing plant. All the, un, all the under uh, uh, non-markable berries going in the bucket and then the, the good berries going into the, into the tray. Stem packs, uh, that's where you get the most bang for your buck. That's for the holidays. Got a long stem on it for dipping in chocolate and stuff like that. You got four pounds of fruit and you're selling it for more than you would for an eight, a, your, your typical eight one pound. You're usually selling for about four, four, four to six dollars a tray more. So we love to pack those, but they're, they're, they tend to uh, happen around the holidays. Here's a harvest trailer where we, where we bring the fruit in and where the, the pickers get their punch for a piece rate and we do an inspection on the berries to make sure they're picking good quality. And here we are loading the trucks out, forklifts, forklifted on, off to the cooler and the customer and that's, that's the life cycle of strawberries. Cool. Like, all the berries that you can on the truck, you know, yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. It's a lot of fruit. That's, let's see, that's probably about, let me see, 14 trays or 14 pallets. That's about, yeah, call, call it, call it 1,500, 1,500 trays, mas o menos, on, the, on, on, on that truck. In peak, we'll be, you know, and we're a small, a mid, uh, you know, on slightly under mid sized company, we'll be, we'll be moving about 300,000 trays a week in peak production. Ta-da, that's, right. thank you. I know it's, uh, it's a little bit late, but you know, you've answered, you've had questions along the way. Uh, any, any more questions? Uh, those of you who if you have to leave, you know, please don't, don't uh, feel like you have to stay, but if there are questions for our speaker, now is the time. Yes. I have a question. So you mentioned um, weed control as it pertains to lighter colored plastics. So what would happen when like the weeds get really bad? Like how do you control that? Do you have to dig up the plastic or what does that kind of look like? Yeah, so it, 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 it Oh, sorry. So uh, the question is, is uh, with the different color plastics, how, how does that impact uh, weed control? And what do you do if you have a lot of weeds, basically? So in clear plastic, that's your biggest problem is weed control. And the weeds will literally grow under the plastic mulch. They'll grow around the plastic mulch, under the plastic mulch. And you literally have to go in through the holes and try and pull it out. It will actually just push the plastic up sometimes. We hate clear plastic. We just, there are guys that do it because they're really trying to get out early. We think, it, it, we're convinced. That the, I'd say in Oxnard where, where you'd, you'd see clear plastic, maybe 10% of the guys do it, and it's, it's brutal. Don't recommend it. But you'll get out fast. And you pretty much just have to. You, yeah, you have to go in. It's all by hand. Yeah, you're, you're, you're by hand on weeding. We, we spend thousands of dollars a year on weeding in black plastic. Imagine what it is in, in clear plastics, double, easy. Yes? So what's the difference in like growing costs for someone who say is growing like 100 acres versus like you guys grow on 1,300 acres, so I imagine you've streamlined a lot of- We have plastic. economy of scale, yeah. So yes. for people on like a smaller scale, I'm guessing that operating costs are higher. Most likely, well, it can cut both ways. I mean, if you're, if you're a family, you know, uh, I mean, so w what I've experienced in my career is that a lot of, a lot of uh, employees that have worked for our company, Hispanic employees that were, 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 were crew bosses or ranch managers, they actually, this is a great opportunity for them to learn the business and they'll go out and start their own deal and they'll start out with 15, 20 acres. Shoot, I know one of them now. He was, he, was, he, he was ranch manager for us 20 years ago for the company. It wasn't when I was there, but I know him. For, for my previous company, he's now one of the largest growers in Oxnard. Learned the trade. He, so he had a low cost of production because he didn't, you know, he didn't have a lot of things, but he didn't have economy of scale either. It can, it can go both ways. Yeah. So how, so how would they compete with like a larger like company when it comes to like selling to supermarkets and stuff. Like so, so in this in this gentleman's case, he went and he found a shipper that he thought would do a good job for him, and that happened to be Driscoll. Right. And then he parlayed growing strawberries into raspberries, and that's Driscoll's. That's their their bread and butter now. That drives their whole program. And he's one of their largest raspberry growers for him now. So he just he just kind of he grew with them. And, well yeah, hey. yeah. Yes. Uh, what do you prefer expanding into more acreage or vertical first? Like, uh, we're, we're, we're close to about as many acres as we want to farm directly ourselves. Like I said, we're going to go up another few hundred next year. I don't know if it's going to go much more than that. We're trying to attract outside growers more now. Um, you know, but that's not easy. They got to buy into your program and think you can do a good job for them. And in a lot of cases, a shipper will advance the grower some portion of what it takes to grow the crop. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's about $8,000 to $10,000. Know, so the grower's got a lot of skin in the game, the shipper's got some skin in the game, and they're, they're in it together. But uh, that's the direction we want to go, is, 
is, is uh, now we've got a large base of our own, we wanna attract more outside growers. Driscoll's most profitable deal is their shipping company, by far, and their, and their, and their plant genetics. Exactly. It's, it's climate. It's climate. It's too hot there. Too hot, too cold. Strawberries like a very mild temperate climate and you get that along the coast. So they just get a shorter season? Far shorter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the guys growing in, in, in that area, their season is probably from March to June, where we're getting seasons that are eight to 12 months long. Yes. Um, you talked about like the different expenses that go into it and how that eventually mounts up to a break even point per tray. Yes. But I know that break even point obviously would vary. Correct. And so what it's all on yield. Yeah, that yeah. break even point sh will slide up and down based on your yield. So, like, grower to grower, shipper to shipper, like, what variables account for most of the disparity between the break even points, if that makes sense? Like, uh, how do people try to? Well, it's, it's just, it's, it, it, every grower has their own way of doing things. And, and some are just able to coax more out of a plant than others, whether it's fertility, the right variety versus what somebody else is growing, um, the right soil, the right water. It's, it's a combination of all these things and applying it at the right time in the right, in the right amounts. Um, it's science and art, you know, to, in, in terms of how you're driving yield. I guess is what you're is that what you're asking? How are you getting differences in yield? Yeah, I guess so. Yield is like accounts for those differences way more than anything like on the, you know, choices and like how you're I guess I don't know what I'm trying to ask exactly, but I guess yeah, yield is the big driver. It's it's a huge driver. Right, yeah. Huge driver. You can do a lot with price, but you can do a lot more with yield. If you get half a crop, you better have a real high price to, to, to compensate for it. But that being said, the other thing is the market, right? Because you don't want high yield when the market is low, so then you're losing money, like you said previously. Like if you're, you have high yield, but the cost <laughs> yeah, is Yeah, it's, it's, it's every, every tray you're selling now, yeah. Every tray more you're selling in a, in a, in a, in a negative market is hurting you more, yeah. But. But at the same time, the more units you're putting through, you are covering some of your grow cost. You know, it gets down to your, you first cover your variable cost, which was that $6.30. $6 anything below that is just absolute disaster. But anything above that, at least you have some amount of revenue going to grow cost. So you keep chiseling away at it, but it ain't enough. You got another six plus dollars in tray in grow cost five, six dollars, depending on, 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 on what you have going on. And so hopefully you're getting all of that for every trade you're doing. But if, if you're not, at least you're hoping it's some of it. Yes. How does the, like, I saw that there's a company that would be produced ag free fruit, which you put it in front of I'm sorry, yeah, that's the holding company. Agri-fruit is simply a holding company for all the other companies. I should have laid it out. Okay. And like, so do, do you have any idea, like, how does the, like, It's much more expensive. It's, it's, uh, I mean, well, just for, just for the glass itself, for the greenhouse glass, you're looking at about, uh, this is, gosh, last time I looked at it, it was about five years ago, it was about $2 million an acre just for the glass, okay? Then, then, then all the equipment to go vertical and stuff like that, ooh, it's expensive. You gotta, you gotta get huge, huge yield to make that stuff pay. Driscoll's really working hard on this stuff uh, themselves. We're watching guys do that. We're watching guys do the, the trellis stuff under the hoops. We're all open field ourselves. And we're watching that and we're just waiting. So the main factor that would prevent 
throwers, do you think that that problem would be that, that you, you basically you were saying like ten I feel like it would be mainly just the cost. Yeah. And so so yeah. is there any if we if, if that part would get the result, is there any motivation for growers to take that route? Like are they willing to do this or just the the, the, the reason for the reason for control you know so controlling the atmosphere and and growing in 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 in, in a in a substrate type environment is to take the transportation out of the equation uh, out of the equation so you'd be, you'd be putting these facilities in new york in chicago in milwaukee in miami and you just grow the fruit locally driscoll thinks that might be the future we'll see it's really expensive they're growing in compton and new jersey now yeah <laughs> yeah yes No, no, that's the ideal is to cover crop. And, and you usually only see that with guys that are doing a 16 month cycle program because you have to have, because your season overlaps a calendar and you got to plant every year, you have to have, if you got a hundred acres here that's still in production, you have to have another hundred acres that you're getting groundwork done and planting on. And so in that scenario, there's an eight month window between the two ranches uh, that are in production over 24 months that's not in production and you could put a cover crop there or you could sublet it to a vegetable grower and they'll put broccoli or lettuce or something else on there and you get the rotation that's very beneficial to the ground um, changing crops on the 12 month cycle it's year after year on the same one and we have to be able to fumigate to do that if we lose fumigation then, then we're gonna have to go into full rotation and a lot of ground to do it, to, to, to avoid all the soil borne diseases that whack you. Fusarium, macrofamina, vert, all that stuff. I'm also wondering what kind of cover crops are commonly used? Uh, so sedan grass is the most common, but uh, uh, mustard's a good one. Uh, it has some some fumigant properties from what I understand in it that that's beneficial. Uh, those are the, the the two that I see mostly. Haven't seen the wheat. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yes. How concerned are you with shortage of labor? So I'm a contrarian in this. All of, the far, all of farming is always lamenting, we don't have enough labor, we have to solve our labor problem. I look at it from a market perspective. If you've got all the labor you want, you're gonna have too much fruit. I love it when labor's tight. And, and then you have to be just a better grower to attract the labor that's available. That's what I prefer. My boss, everybody else out there, they all want as much labor as possible. I'm like, no, we don't, we want less labor. So. It's a concern though. If you, don't, if you don't have enough labor and you got a large investment out there and you can't get it picked, that's terrible. It's no good. But over time, over the course of several years, if there's not enough labor, and we ran into this at one point in time in the industry where there simply wasn't enough labor to get it harvested, acreage went down. And when there was, okay, case study, uh, my, my, my previous company, Eclipse Berry Farms, in I think it was 2014, um, labor was super tight. Everybody was fighting over labor. We're all, it's bidding wars for the labor. We can't get enough. We picked 6,500 crates per acre and printed money because there wasn't enough. Nobody could get their crop picked. There wasn't enough supply out there. And we made boatloads of money. The next year, people started bringing H2A programs in. And that's where you import workers from, from Mexico to add to the to labor pool. There was a bunch of that going on. Driscoll was the pioneer in really trying to drive that. The next year, there was enough labor. We picked 9,500 crates per acre and lost a ton of money. I like less labor, but I'm, I'm, I'm the outlier. Everybody, you go to a strawberry, a strawberry commission meeting, there'll be 40 growers there in, in, in this meeting and every one of them is lamenting labor. I'm like, good, good, I like that. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. 
Yes. Well, yeah, so, 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 yeah, if there's not enough, you don't have enough labor, yeah. it's going to hurt. Yeah. You're going to take a financial hit, most likely. If you can't get your, you know, 90, at least 90% of your crop off, you're going to lose money. So for you in the short term, that's bad. But if the industry doesn't have labor, then they're going to contract and supply is going to tighten up, most likely. In strawberry, that's the case because it's so regional and coastal, there aren't other options it'll tighten the supply up and then we'll make money. Maybe for something that's not, it may be for something that where there, there, you need a lot of labor and you could grow this something anywhere. Uh, that's a little, that's a different story. Are you guys paying higher for the labor We, we, we tend to be r r not the highest, but close. The way we, we tend to manage our labor pretty good and have enough, the way we do it is, is, is if we just grow a better crop. We're just better. And so the growers want to, or the pickers want to come to us. That's. So why do the pickers want to come when you have a better grower? So if you've got, if you're growing a better crop and say you're going to yield, instead of 7,500, you're going to yield 9,000 trays per acre on that ranch and you're, you're killing it, a, 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 a picker and they all got phones, they all got social media, they'll look at your ranch and they'll look at your neighbor's ranch. They're going to the ranch that has more, more volume on it because they're going to make more money. And, and the pickers, uh, shoot, when we're in, we're, we're, in, we're in peak harvest, our top pickers are making 30 to $35 an hour, you know, with, with the piece rate that they're, that they're earning. On the low end, probably 20, somewhere in there. On the shoulders, when it really slows down, you know, then you're actually, you're at your, your hourly rate, you know, whatever that, whatever that is. It tends to be higher than minimum wage, but. Good questions, everybody. Any, any final questions? All right. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you guys. Hope.